in the first place, and thank you very much as well for the introduction. Um, I'm, I mean, others have said it before, but I will repeat that I'm truly honored to be standing here, and that's true. Uh, I was um, nervous about uh, finding something that would make sense uh, to you. Uh, when I looked at the program and I saw getting engaged, it reminded me that I claim to be possibly the only specialist in the world of the ritual of marriage proposals, uh, getting engaged. Um, and, and then I realized maybe this was not the issue of today. And, and so I will abstain from describing exotic rituals from the US. Um, so I'll, I'll focus on the object of today's discussion uh, and I will focus on Foucault and on engagement. I'm quite confident that I've spent the last 20 years uh, being engagé, so that I felt I've done that. Uh, but I, I didn't feel that I was the most qualified uh, Foucault uh, scholar. There are many people, of course. Uh, there's actually, being a Foucault scholar is a bit of a cottage industry. Uh, and, and so I will focus more not on expertise on Foucault, but on doing something with Foucault, uh, since I imagine that's part of what you're all trying to do. Um, let me start with the concept of uh, actualité, um, which I believe translates into English as actuality, uh, except that in French it has the advantage of being a term uh, that can function in the singular or in the plural. Uh, if you say actuality in the plural, that's the news. That is, it's what is actually going on in the media, in politics, uh, what is in the public sphere. If you're talking about Foucault's concept of actuality, you have something quite different. Uh, in fact, he introduces the term uh, in a discussion in 1977 uh, in which he uh, says, and I will quote, or rather translate, uh, it seems to me, he says, uh, that since the 19th century, philosophy hasn't stopped uh, getting near one question. What is going on actuellement? And what are we, we who are maybe nothing else and nothing more than that which is going on actuellement? Um, the question of philosophy, he continued, is the question of that present, which is ourselves, which is why philosophy today is entirely political and entirely historical. It is politics imminent to history. It is the history that is indispensable to politics. Uh, this uh, take on actuality uh, as a political present, as a present uh, that is permeated with history, is the exact opposite of the news. Uh, the news, in many ways, actuality in the plural, is uh, what is outside of history uh, in a constant present of erasure. Uh, that is, if you look at a web page, uh, what you see is that the news keeps changing, uh, which means that, of course, though there's the remnants uh, of the past, the past is obliterated by this permanent present. This presentism <coughs> of the news is exactly the opposite of actuality as uh, defined by Foucault, I believe. Uh, this has to do uh, also with his uh, reading of Kant's uh, famous text, What is Enlightenment? Um, what Foucault argued uh, was that uh, the, what was so specific, what was so important about that text uh, was the fact that uh, Kant uh, was introducing a reflection on the contemporary status of his own enterprise, that is, on the historicity of his thinking. And this is the second meaning for me of actuality. Actuality is not just about the fact that the world uh, is in a present that is historicized, but that the thinking that we have about the world is also caught up in this historicized present. Uh, and he goes on about uh, Kant. Uh, no doubt it is not the first time that a philosopher has given his reasons for undertaking his work at a particular moment. 
but it seems to me that it's the first time a philosopher has connected in this way closely and from the inside the significance of his work with respect to knowledge, a reflection on history and a particular analysis of the specific moment at which he is writing and because of which he is writing. It is in the reflection on today as difference in history and as a motive for a particular philosophical task that the novelty of this text appears to me. Uh, what I want to argue is that this approach of actuality, uh, actuality which is both in what is going on in the world, something's going on, but also what we're thinking about is caught up in this present that is moving under our feet, um, is what makes it political. It has an epistemological dimension. Uh, the way I picture it is, um, if you think of the, the paintings by Salvador Dali, uh, where you have these soft, melting watches, uh, it seems to me that the concepts that we use are also soft, melting watches. That is, the watches are melting because they are caught up in time. Uh, in the same way, the concepts that we use are concepts uh, that are not outside of history, that are not above history, that are not beyond history, but that are caught up in history and, and politics. But the, the, the reason why this has political implications in terms of engagement um, is because, uh, as Foucault argues, uh, then critique, and of course he's referring to Kant, is not just uh, what defines our limitations, but also the possibility of thinking beyond these limitations. And that is the reason why it has a, a crucial political uh, value. I'll, I'll conclude this uh, lengthy introduction with uh, two elements. One uh, is the fact that if we look at uh, Foucault's work and, and see how he's been thinking of actuality, an example that is very often taken is that of his work as a journalist in Iran. I think more relevant uh, is his uh, teaching about neoliberalism. Uh, what is most remarkable about the 1979 lectures on neoliberalism is that Foucault was uh, analyzing something that was going on in 1979. Uh, in fact, I think that is rare in the history of philosophy uh, and even rare in the work of Foucault. Uh, so his work on neoliberalism, I think to me, is the best illustration of what it means to work on uh, actuality. The second example that I would like uh, to take from his work uh, to think about the historicity of concepts. Uh, I have been involved um, this year in um, the, a new edition in French of Herculine Barbin. Uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with this um, memoir uh, published first in the 19th century of a hermaphrodite uh, and republished by Foucault in 1978. It sort of vanished from view, uh, but in French it has retained more presence, much more presence in English in particular through the work and reading of Judith Butler. But what was um, interesting to me is that the preface that uh, Foucault wrote for the American edition, uh, Le Vrai Sex, True Sex, uh, is a text that I think um, can be read precisely as a text of its time and that we have to rethink now in terms of gender. That is the missing concept for Foucault is that of gender, which makes it impossible for him to understand uh, some of what is going on in the text uh, because what is going on in the text is not so much about sex, but much more about gender. I'm not going to develop that, but what I want to point out is that in fact, we're all thinking with the tools that are available and thinking historically about these tools is a way I think, uh, even as we may criticize Foucault, is a way to engage his uh, thinking. <coughs> now, after this long introduction, uh, the rest will not be as interminable and there will be an end, I promise. Uh, I, I want um, to start from a, um, a personal uh, note, uh, uh, precisely in the context of the republication of Herculine Barbin. I interviewed uh, last year uh, Daniel Defer. And Daniel Defer, as you may know, was uh, Foucault's uh, partner. And um, he 
it was interesting because he had shortly before uh, donated or rather sold uh, all the archives of Foucault uh, to the National Library in France. And many people felt uncomfortable about the fact that it didn't seem very, how shall I put it, very generous to sell Foucault's archives. I thought it was very interesting that in an interview published in Le Nouvel Observateur, De Fer made this into a political argument, uh, saying that he wanted basically to show that there was something like héritage, legacy, uh, precisely because it had been denied at the time of Foucault's death, including for very material reasons, that is, how to manage inheriting an apartment and having to pay full taxes because they were not considered to be partners by the state. Uh, there's more to it, but I thought that this political dimension of private life in uh, the selling of the archives of Foucault was an interesting political thing. And actually, uh, Daniel de Fer had explained uh, that he felt very Balzacien, uh, so a sort of 19th century uh, vision of inheritance uh, rights, which I thought in the context, that is in the context of French discussions about uh, same-sex marriage, was quite interesting. And indeed, he was thinking about that context. I interviewed him uh, at that very uh, moment. Um, and that is, uh, in the weeks uh, around the, the final uh, vote, in the first few days, actually, after the final approval of the Tobira law on same-sex marriage. And the interview was not about same-sex marriage. It was about uh, Herculine Barbin. Uh, but what was interesting is that as I was leaving the apartment that he had inherited and that the selling of the archives might enable him to restore, because it looked like it hadn't been restored in the last 30 years, uh, which I thought was interesting as well. Um, so what he, um, he did as I was leaving, he stopped me and said two things. And, and I read all the quotes that I translated into English. Did you know that Foucault wanted us to get married? It was very funny. One day he read in the gay press that some Presbyterian minister in Scotland celebrated same-sex weddings. He says to me, let's go. So I tell him, listen, it's absurd. We're not religious and we'll have no legal value. What are we going to look like? And he continues, I'm the one who didn't want to, but he did. I now regret it. It would have been symbolic. And he continued, because this is in a political context, um, of the use of Foucault, he says, people put words in his mouth. No way Foucault would have supported gay marriage. And of course, what he's saying is, look, maybe he didn't support gay marriage, but he wanted to marry me. As I echoed him with, this, uh, with a quote, Foucault would have had a good laugh, which has been used uh, by many people in France, saying hm, gays shouldn't want gay marriage, um, De Fer responded, well, no, he would not have had a good laugh. And he then goes on with a second story. Foucault, would have, um, he actually wanted two things. He wanted us to get married, and he wanted us to adopt a child. We heard from a friend who had just adopted a Filip Filipino child. Foucault rose to his feet and grabbed his passport to travel to the Philippines. I'm the one who said, are you sure? Are we sure he'll be happy? We were afraid he would be harassed in school as a fag baby. Now, I thought that was oh, an interesting reflection on the uh, use of Foucault in the politics of same-sex marriage. Uh, the, the idea that Foucault, of course, being a radical, would be against same-sex marriage, which of course is a liberal claim. Uh, this, I think, is more complicated. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm not putting words in Foucault's mouth by saying he would have supported gay marriage, but I think it reveals that this distinction between liberal politics and radical politics may not be so efficient. Uh, in fact, the idea that on the one hand there are laws, that's the liberal uh, perspective, and on the other hand there are norms, and that's the radical perspective, uh, does not take into account that of course they're linked. Uh, and questioning one questions the other 
and uh, vice versa. Uh, so in fact, uh, what I think is interesting is that there's no such uh, opposition. Foucault never wrote one word against the legal recognition of same-sex unions, uh, but actually he said the contrary. He said, I'm all in favor of rights. But what, what is more interesting is that what was interesting to him was the invention of relations. It was not the recognition of relations. It was the invention of relations. Uh, creating a new cultural life under the cover, he said, of our sexual choices. So it was not either invention or gay rights, but gay rights as a possibility for having uh, invention. What is interesting is to reflect on what invention could mean for Foucault. Uh, for example, on the question of adoption. He was asked about the adoption, and, and specifically adoption of children, and he responded, or why not that of an adult by another adult? Why could I not adopt a friend who's 10 years younger than I, or even 10 years older? What is interesting in this is first adoption of a friend, that is not adopting a son or a daughter, but adopting a friend, which is a way of subverting the distinction between families and friends. And of course, the idea that one could adopt someone older than oneself, which was a legal possibility in Roman law, but which has become unthinkable uh, for most of us because we assume that adoption is in some ways related uh, or is in some ways an image of reproduction, uh, is a way of subverting this obviousness of the fact that nature is behind it, uh, that there is something like a natural filiation at stake. Now, uh, what is interesting then is that um, families of choice uh, are a way to think of invention within the family. So the problem, I think, uh, we could say for Foucault is not that he would have laughed uh, in the face of new claims for recognition by same-sex couples and queer families. He might have been bored. He might have yawned, thinking it's not very interesting. Uh, but in fact, it's within uh, legal um, forms that invention uh, will become uh, possible. So this is what I want to explore a bit further now, that is the politics of laws and norms, and uh, not accept uh, a priori the idea that they're in uh, stark opposition. So what I want to do is to use Foucault's work to move between this contrast between liberal and radical politics, not to convert him to liberal politics, nor to reclaim him for radical politics. Uh, changing rights can reshape norms, just as evolving norms can redraw rights. So, still on the issue of marriage. Um, what is going on is that, of course, the state, and more generally power, has to do with the formation of subjects, with not only uh, subjection, but also subjectivation. And therefore, questioning how the state works, how laws work, is a way of questioning this process of uh, the double movement of subjection and subjectivation. And this is why I think the marriage of two men or two women cannot not be political, uh, despite uh, the fact that people may not want it to be political. It is political uh, despite uh, people's intentions or regardless of people's uh, intention. Uh, for example, uh, if you have uh, same-sex marriage, all of a sudden, 
it reveals the fact that marriage until now had been straight marriage. This was very visible in a document produced by the Catholic Church in France resisting uh, the creation of the Tobiha law. Of course, they opposed opening marriage to same-sex couples, uh, but what, what was interesting is that they ins insisted on preserving heterosexual marriage. Now, the introduction of the term heterosexual marriage in a Catholic document produced by the bishops, I think, signals uh, a shift in norms. That is, if even French Catholic bishops uh, call it straight marriage, uh, something has happened. That is, a political battle means that all of a sudden it has particularized marriage. And this particularization of marriage is a way to make it visible not as they claim as a natural institution, but as a social institution. And it gives leverage uh, to question the norms at stake through the political battle on rights and norms. Um, the, the question then, uh, for me, has been to try and take this into account in a way that is both resonant with Foucault's work, but also distinct from Foucault's work. Because in fact, this is not what Foucault was interested in. So how can we think about it? Uh, I have tried to develop a concept which I find useful, at least for my own work, and hopefully for others, uh, which is that of sexual democracy. Uh, and let me explain uh, why this concept uh, can be useful, again, at least for me and hopefully for others. Foucault doesn't speak much about democracy. Democracy actually has not been part of the vocabulary of critical thinkers, not just Foucault, but if you think of Bourdieu, if you think of Derrida and all that, it's not their main concern. In many ways, uh, I think they have been suspicious of the pious uh, use of such words as democracy. Uh, and in many ways, I think they have uh, tried to resist the illusions of liberal uh, democracy. Does that mean that the word should be abandoned? Uh, clearly, that is not my uh, understanding. And I think uh, we have other examples, such as that of Jacques Rancière, uh, who have shown uh, how we can make a profitable use of the term democracy that is not restri restricted to a liberal definition of, of democracy. So let me explain what I mean by sexual democracy. Um, first, uh, the term democracy, I would say, is not about institutions, at least in the use uh, that I suggest. Uh, it's not about institutions. It's about the way a society represents itself. Um, and there are two options. One is to consider that the order of things, uh, that the laws, the norms, the rules are defined once and for all by some transcendent principle. Uh, and that transcendent principle can be nature, it can be God, it can be tradition, sometimes even science as we saw in the debate on same-sex marriage in France with the invocation of anthropology as a foundation of uh, a transcendent order. That's one way of thinking about society. But there's another way uh, to think about it, and that is uh, to insist on the fact that we live in societies uh, that claim to define themselves. That is, that claim that they define their own laws and norms and rules. Hence, that the order of things is not transcendent, it's imminent. It's this imminence of laws and norms that, I argue, defines democracy. Now, what about sex? Why should sex be relevant uh, in this story? The history of democracy, that is, of democratic regimes, uh, since the 18th century has been premised on the idea uh, that there should be a separation between private and public, and therefore an exclusion of the private <coughs> sphere from the political, which translated and has long translated into the exclusion of women. Uh, so the exclusion of women from democracy is not accidental, it's fundamental. It's a way of saying there's that which is political and that which is not. 
Uh, what is going on today, uh, I think, is uh, that the question is raised whether democracy need, this ex uh, need exclude uh, women, or on the contrary, should make sex a democratic issue. Uh, why are there so many discussions, and I have focused on France, but as you know, the debates about same-sex marriage have become international issues, or uh, the question of the place of women, including, and I will uh, get to that in a few minutes, including through the debates on the Islamic veil, for example. So the question of the place of women and the place of sexuality uh, in society has become uh, a political issue, uh, whereas it had been argued for a long time that these were non-political issues, especially in France. There was a concerted effort in France to uh, justify intellectually through Republican arguments. Uh, and the rise of these Republican arguments coincided with the death of Michel Foucault. Uh, so the Republican arguments insisted that sex had nothing to do with politics, that sex was private that sex was about mores, not politics, uh, that it was about civility, that it was about conversation, not about public uh, debate. So what has been going on in France, and I believe in many countries, is the publicization of sex. It has always already been political in the sense that it's always about power, but the politicization of sex is the publicization of this political nature of sex. So this is not specific to France, uh, but it's interesting that France is one country that has resisted uh, this very much, not just in conservative terms by saying we should preserve the traditional order as you may have seen in the streets of France in the last few years, uh, but more importantly by saying this is not political. Uh, the, the problem is not that some people oppose on political grounds uh, the new sexual politics, but that they oppose it on theoretical grounds by saying it's outside of politics. So what I argue is that sexual democracy is precisely the fact that that which was supposed to be left out of politics is now central to politics because it raises the question of the limits of democratic politics. Does this imminent definition extend to all issues or are there limits? Are there certain issues in our societies that escape democratic logic or not? That I think is the battle uh, that is going on. Now this imminent definition um, means that in fact what we're talking about is not the reality of these societies, talking about democracy or about sexual democracy does not mean, for example, that in France or elsewhere, women are free, men and women are equal, um, and there's no hierarchy of sexualities. What it means it, this is that this has become debatable, that people can uh, argue against the natural order of things. Hence, this publicization of the politics uh, of, of marriage. So it's about representation, not about the reality. But of course, representation matters, and it has to do with the public sphere. And of course, the problem of the public sphere, as we know from the discussions that have followed uh, Habermas's argument, is the question of who has access to the public sphere. And so the politics of the public sphere is in part a politics of sex. Uh, that is, the question of having uh, those who have no place in the public sphere heard is what is going on. That is the notion of counter publics. One final element about this definition of sexual democracy. Uh, the use of terms such as liberty and equality uh, may uh, seem to resonate with a liberal definition of democracy that is with what I would call a transcendent definition of liberty and equality as uh, principles that are above us. What I would argue is that if you look at the politics of sexual democracy in the last decades, uh, it hasn't been in practice about applying universal principles of liberty and equality. It has been a debate 
about what these principles mean. Let's look at the debate on prostitution, which is not specific to France, which is encountered in many countries. Uh, the debate on prostitution is not a debate between people who oppose freedom and people who support freedom. It's two definitions of freedom that are at stake. Those who say one should be free uh, to, um, to practice sex work and those who will say it's not a matter of freedom because in fact you cannot be free to sell your own body, for example. The two arguments are in the name of freedom. Or if you look at the debates about the Islamic veil, on both sides, people claim to speak in the name of liberty, in the name of equality. That is, regardless of the, of the position uh, defended on both these issues, uh, it's a debate within the terms of sexual democracy. So liberty and equality do not serve as transcendent references because the meanings attached to these terms are defined in the process of the political battle. Uh, what liberty means is what people are fighting about. It's not what, the, they're, it's not what, the, what they are applying or refusing. It's what they're fighting about, not just fighting for. Um, now, this argument about sexual democracy uh, as I said, has a historical dimension. That is, it says, whereas sex is that which was supposed to be excluded from the democratic purview, in fact, it has become the core of democratic uh, battles. Which means, indeed, there is today, in actuality, something special about sex, which is not linked to the nature of sex, but to the uh, politics of sex, to the sexual democracy that I have talked about. And this, I think, resonates with the argument that Foucault makes in the history of sexuality, even though, I will say, of course, in different terms. You recall that in uh, his, the first volume, uh, Will to Knowledge, he says, man for millennia remained what he was to Aristotle, a living animal in addition capable of a political existence. Modern man is an animal in whose politics his life as a living being is at stake. So sex is crucial to modern politics for Foucault. Power talks of sexuality and to sexuality. So whereas we're, we're, if we're talking about uh, biopower or if we're talking about sexual democracy, in both cases, sex is the political issue par excellence. However, uh, there's a big difference. Uh, whereas both sexual democracy and biopower have to do with the fact that power talks of and to sexuality, sexual democracy speaks about liberty and equality, while biopower talks of regulation and discipline. Um, I think this is what I uh, would like to explore now or the difference between the two concepts and how they can, it can be useful to confront them, or that is to use them not by erasing their differences, not by opposing one to the other, but by actually confronting all them. <clears throat> I think the, the idea of regulation and discipline uh, in Foucault's work, and this is why the notion of democracy is not uh, at the core of his uh, reflections has to do with the public sphere. Uh, and the public sphere is not uh, something that is uh, central in Foucault's argument by any means. Um, in many ways, the discussion is about norms and norms are that which takes place outside of the public sphere. But what I would argue is that indeed what is going on today about sex is that norms have entered the public sphere. Uh, my reading of Judith Butler's Gender Trouble uh, is historical. That is, why should one write a book called Gender Trouble today? And why should people be interested? I'm not saying people shouldn't be. Uh, I think they should be. But the question is, why are they interested? I would argue it's for historical reasons. 
that is for reasons that have to do with the fact that norms are not obvious any longer. We're not sure they ever were, but for sure they're not today. That is, they're an object of discussion. So gender trouble is more generally norm trouble. There's trouble in the norms. That is, the norms don't go without saying anymore. They're under discussion. They're contested. Uh, they're an object of debate. They're openly politicized. So this publicization of norms, I think, uh, is again that which helps undermine the opposition between the politics of norms and the politics of the public sphere. Actually, the way we relate to norms today is transformed by the fact that norms are under discussion. How we embody being men, women, gay, straight, whatever, um, is not just between ourselves and ourselves. Uh, it's uh, mediated by the public sphere. And we cannot ignore that. Uh, and actually, I have argued that even the Catholic Church, even the Pope, or the Popes, uh, have been uh, partaking in sexual democracy. Not that they would claim to do that, uh, as far as I know, uh, but they engage in a discussion. The reactionaries that have been demonstrating in the streets of France are also actually invoking, for example, the logic of gender. Uh, they oppose the so-called theory of gender, uh, but they have signs saying, uh, do not change our stereotypes of gender, which means that they believe in gender. Uh, and that's the novelty. Even those who hate the so-called theory of gender believe that gender matters, that there are stereotypes at stake, except that they think they should be changed. They shouldn't be changed. Uh, so I think we cannot exclude uh, the public sphere from our reflection on these uh, transformation. The difference uh, between the concept of biopower and that of sexual democracy is not solely a difference uh, between uh, a view uh, that takes into account the public sphere and one that doesn't. It's also between a vision that might seem optimistic and a vision that might seem pessimistic. Um, biopower uh, is not um, a very, how, how shall I say, rosy view of the world. Uh, so what do we do with that? I, I'm not trying to develop um, a conception of sexual democracy that would say, it's looking great and tomorrow will be better. Uh, and I will not say the opposite either. Uh, but what I would say is that uh, what we have to say about uh, sexual democracy and these uh, shifts um, has to be understood in a context of actuality. And this is what I want to do now, is to think about the fact that sexual democracy is not just a concept that can be used in the way that I have shown as a critical concept, but in practice it can be used also in a normative way. And this has to do with race. And this is the point that I want to uh, develop uh, now. After 9-11, uh, the rhetoric of the clash of civilizations that had emerged uh, following the fall of the Berlin Wall, that is, after the Cold War, the rhetoric of the clash of civilizations was reformulated uh, in new terms. It became, for many, the sexual clash of civilizations. That is, the difference between us and them became a difference between us, sexual <laughs> democrats, and them, sexual conservatives, sexual reactionaries, sexual archaic peoples. So this distinction between us and them has played an important role uh, throughout Europe, but much beyond. Um, in part, uh, it has justified uh, imperialism. Uh, one may recall that Laura Bush, uh, who was not until then 
uh, best known for her feminist work, uh, decided that the reason why the US had to go to Afghanistan was to emancipate Afghan women. Uh, and, but that's an imperialist version that is exporting sexual democracy, freeing women. Um, and, and this is um, uh, something that has been important uh, since 9-11. But uh, there's also the European version, uh, which is different. Uh, it's not about exporting sexual democracy, but it's about preserving sexual democracy in Europe by fighting immigration. Fortress Europe is justified not in the name of racism and xenophobia, uh, none of us are xenophobic or racist, of course, uh, but all of us support uh, democratic values and in particular sexual democracy. Uh, we are all, uh, even though we may not have been aware of it, we're all feminists, for example, and we've all been fighting homophobia, uh, and therefore that's the reason why we want to limit the number of migrants uh, from Africa. This is why we want to limit the rights of Muslims. This is why we want to have fewer others. We love others, but they don't love women and gays. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, so this European version uh, is interesting because, in fact, it translates also into policies. Uh, for example, the discourse about national identity developed by Nicolas Sarkozy was a discourse that had to do with um, not just ethnic or racial principles that he rejected, but in fact with principles of uh, liberty and equality for women. He didn't go as far as to mention gays and lesbians, but nobody's perfect. Uh, so this um, racialization of the nation uh, has played an important role, and I think many of you are familiar with these discussions that have taken place, for example, under the rubric homo-nationalism, uh, but I think it extends far beyond homo-nationalism because it's, it's in fact about the new sexual nationalisms uh, that apply both to questions of homosexuality and to questions of gender and, and women's uh, rights. So I will not develop that much more, but what I want to point out is how uh, it can be useful to revert uh, to Foucault's concept of biopower, uh, precisely because it's a concept uh, in which the intersection of sex and race uh, plays a role. And we can see how sexual democracy is not just a critical concept, but a normative concept at the same time. That is, it can be used uh, to discipline, to regulate, and not just to undermine. So in essence, sexual democracy is neither uh, subversive nor normative. It is both. The same could be said about gender, and I think the same could be said about all the concepts that we can use. Uh, concepts are not, do not have a transcendent meaning. They have meanings that are attached to their uses. And so if we can use them for a certain purpose, that means someone else can use them for a different purpose. And that's why we have to think about actuality. That is, we cannot afford not to think about how concepts are used, not just by ourselves, but by others at the same time. We cannot ignore the fact that feminism is not just used by feminists, for example. Uh, we cannot ignore the fact that gay rights are not just mobilized by gay activists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, this would apply for racial politics as well. Um, what has been going on in the French uh, discussions about same-sex marriage has to do with race. And it has to do with race in one <coughs> interesting way, I think, which has been underestimated is the fact that the battle, and it's not just about France, I think many countries in Europe, or the focus has been, contrary to the US, on filiation. It hasn't been about marriage per se. In many ways, no one cares about marriage. Marriage is much more a vital issue in the US, hence my work on getting engaged uh, through marriage proposals in the US. Marriage proposals are an American ritual uh, today not a French one. Uh, so why is 
marriage sacralized in the US, I would argue, and I will say this briefly, for reasons that have to do with race. Oh, that is, having children out of wedlock is racialized. It's about non-whites. It's a stigma attached to single African American women. One example of this was when uh, Barack <coughs> Obama joked uh, in, in a dinner uh, where he was supposed to make jokes about the fact that he'd been accused of all kinds of things, including Fox News, accusing him of fathering two African-American children in wedlock. Uh, when he said that, of course, he was playing on the fact that fathering African-American children has to do with wedlock, that is, with outside of wedlock. And so the joke was perceived he needn't explain because marriage is about race in the US. So the sacralization of marriage is the sacralization of the nation through race. I would argue that the same is true about filiation in France and throughout Europe. Uh, filiation is about the nation and it is racialized. So in fact, uh, the discussions about filiation are not just discussions about gay marriage. They're not just about gays and lesbians. They're equally about who's French and who's not. That is, if you start denaturalizing filiation in the family, that is, if you start saying that those people who are thought to be against nature, gays and lesbians, uh, that they're actually not unnatural, that they are part of the circle of the family, then you're saying the family is not natural. But if the family is not natural, if affiliation is not natural, the nation is not natural either. And so French blood is not just about blood, which of course goes against the developments of the last 30 years. In the last 30 years in France and in many countries in Europe, the whole politics of immigration has been uh, about not just migrants, but the children of migrants possibly the grandchildren of migrants who keep being defined in France, in French, and in many other countries and languages as second generation, third generation, that is still defined in terms of origin, that is defined in terms of race. So denaturalizing the family or denaturalizing uh, the nation, the two are related. That's one way to think about what has happened since 9-11. Instead of having this opposition between racial politics and sexual politics, between sexual democracy and the instrumentalization of sexual democracy for xenophobic and racist purposes, we can try and recombine the two and point out how this is about simultaneously sex and race. It's not either or, it's not one against the other, but it's the two together. Denaturalizing the world uh, has to do simultaneously with sex and with race. And this is where uh, Foucault's argument about biopower, I think, uh, helps criticize this concept of um, sexual uh, democracy. When uh, Foucault talks about biopower and biopolitics in the first volume of the history of sexuality, of course it's about sex, as we saw in the earlier quotes that I gave. It's about sex. But at the same time, the word race keeps appearing. And the volume was published in 1976, and that same year, in 1976, in the lectures at the Collège de France, race was very much an issue. Race was at the core of his definition of biopower. That is, in fact, biopower is not about sex, it's about sex and race simultaneously. So the regulation through biopower of sex is the regulation of sex and race. This 
was shown very powerfully by historian and anthropologist Anne Stoller uh, in a book uh, about Foucault uh, on race and the education of desire, which, is a, which was a critical reading <laughs> of the history of sexuality and of the fact that there's this uh, remarkable blind spot in the analysis by Michel Foucault uh, of the West, that is, the colonies. Um, but what I think is interesting is that the point is not to say that Foucault was blind to this, but to say that he was blind and not blind. That is, at this, on the one hand, he was focusing in the history of sexuality on sex, but on the other hand, in his lectures the very same year, he was developing an argument about uh, race and about the politics and the, the wars uh, of race. I want to conclude because I believe that um, I should leave at least a few minutes for discussion. Uh, I'll conclude with uh, one uh, reference going back to the uh, neo-liberal uh, uh, argument of, uh, of Foucault. I think it is interesting uh, that uh, Michel Foucault's argument about neoliberalism is in a book called uh, Naissance de la Biopolitique. Uh, that is, the link between biopolitics and neoliberalism is uh, something that we have to explore. Um, I think I would like to uh, make a reference to uh, work that I have done recently on the Roma issue uh, in France and I think in Europe in the light of Foucault's concept of uh, biopower. What has been remarkable about um, uh, the Roma or not the Roma, rather, but the Roma question, that is the way the Roma have been treated in France and elsewhere, is um, the racialization that is producing radical otherness through politics uh, and politics in everyday life by not collecting garbage or by making sure that people don't have, have access to toilets, etc. cetera. Uh, so this racialization uh, of the Roma, which is an extreme form of the racialization that I have been talking about, about migrants and Muslims, etc. It's an extreme form that need not even be justified in the name of sexual democracy. In France, people don't even need to say that the Roma are bad to their wives and to their gays. There's no need for euphemism. There's no need for democratic justification. It's race in its purest form including biological. Now, the question that I want to ask is how can we use uh, Foucault's concept of biopower? Some have done this by insisting on the notion of camps, since the word camp is used constantly. And of course, you have the Agamben reading, etc. The echo then is that of World War II and of concentration camps. There are two problems, at least, with this perspective, in my view. Uh, one is that uh, it's not quite accurate, and the second is that it's politically counterproductive. In my view, it's politically counterproductive because it gives the impression that it's always the same thing. And therefore, people have an easy time refuting this kind of argument by saying, come on, we're not exterminating the Roma. And it's true, as one uh, French officials said uh, three years ago, four years ago, uh, Arnaud Klarsfeld, he said, we're not taking them to Auschwitz. Indeed. Uh, and, and so if we want to avoid that kind of response, we have to think about what's different about what's going on today. Of course it has to do with biopolitics. But biopolitics need not be the same thing all the time. There's more to biopolitics than concentration camps from World War II. So I think our work is not just to dehistoricize, it's to historicize. That is, to use concepts, but reformulate them uh, in order to make them relevant for what we're doing today and for what is going on today. So biopower cannot always be the same thing. And that's where the work on neoliberalism is important. What would be neoliberal biopower? My argument is that the example of the Roma can serve uh, to illustrate historicity. Uh, neoliberal 
politics and policies. Neoliberal biopower is not about making die. Uh, it's not either about making live. So it's not the old sovereignty, but it's not the new uh, biopower. It's something else. What I would argue is that it's about not letting live without making die. That is, making life unlivable. If this is true, then I think it helps think about how a concept cannot be used ahistorically. Using Foucault does not mean that we have to replicate in a different context the same thing. What I think Foucault has been doing all his life is moving. Of course, when you read every 10 years or five years or two years, Foucault is explaining that he's always been doing the same thing. Uh, but he has to explain it again and again, because in fact, he's never doing the same thing. And why? Not because he's inconsistent, not just because he's growing up or growing, uh, but in fact, because the world is moving. That is, he's thinking like the watches of Salvador Dali that are soft or melting, uh, but soft and melting should be our political ideal of historicity. Thank you. <laughs>